Chapter Seventeen of Between the Larchwoods and the Weir. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo. Between the Larchwoods and the Weir by Flora Clickman. Chapter Seventeen Moon Gold in the Garden. The flame of August is over all the garden, a blaze of yellow and scarlet, orange and red, for most of the blues and pinks go out with July. Though the lavender flowers are opening intensely blue, and big clumps of eryngium with blue stems as well as blue flower heads make masses of contrasting color amidst the sunflowers, single and double, and the eschultzias and marigolds glowing golden and undaunted by the hottest sunshine. The flowers of the red-hot poker rival their namesakes, broad-spreading clumps of Montebrescia, each waving hundreds of fiery orange and red blossoms, have sprung into existence since last we were here, from lowly, modest-looking patches of green blades. The second crop of Gloire de Dijon roses are out, likewise holding in their hearts remembrance of the hot sunshine that pervades the earth. Geraniums, turned out of doors to get a little air, though there certainly isn't much to get just now, are shouting aloud in pride of their heavy scarlet bosses. The mountain ash trees contribute plenty of color, each branch bent down with a smother of a bunches of berries, which are being eagerly devoured by blackbirds, thrushes, and hawfinches. Tall red and yellow hollyhocks try to persuade you that they are nearly as high and quite as brilliant as the mountain ash. Nasturtiums trail all over the place, climbing where there is next to nothing to support them, with flowers so thick you lose count of the foliage, and what a dazzling mass they make, touched apparently with every shade of yellow and brown and red, from blossoms of palest primrose marked with vivid scarlet, past salmon color streaked with orange, and lemon yellow splashed with chocolate, to dark mahogany red smoked with deep purple brown. They smother weeds, that gain in impudence as the season advances, and cover bare places where bulbs and earlier blooming plants have died down. They hang over the tops of walls. They crowd the border pinks into the paths. They get mixed up with the hedges, and surprise you by sending out vermilion flowers at the top of a sedate old box tree, clipped to look like a solid square table. They run out of the little white gate into the lane, and they creep under the rails into the orchard. Indeed, there are times when their exuberance almost makes one tired, more especially if the thermometer favors the nineties. The garden walls are teeming with color. Sweet Alyssum has seated itself wherever it can find a spare niche, rather a difficulty unless a plant goes house-hunting quite early in the season. Though the white and purple Erebus finished flowering months ago, it contributes crimson and purple to the color scheme, as its foliage ripens in the hot sun. Any intelligent gardener can tell me that the top of a sunny wall is far too hot for a fuchsia. Certainly, and of course it is, especially in August. Yet some misguided person had one planted there, just where the wall has a break in it, and a flight of steps leads down to the next level. It is the lovely old-fashioned bush sort, smothered with slender drooping blossoms, and it reaches out long arms that arch right over the steps, and as you go down, unless you lower your head, you set a tinkling scores of crimson bells with rich blue-purple centers and people who understand all about fuchsias glare at it severely, and then at me, and remark, 
a most unsuitable position. And where nothing else in particular is making any sort of a show, the ubiquitous Herb Robert spreads itself about on the top of the walls or roots and crevices down the sides. It is in particular where, so long as there are stones that need clothing with a loveliness, there you will find it, laying its crimson leaves with a lacy airiness over the stern surface of the rock. The very scents of the garden are hot and pungent, as one rubs against thyme and marjoram, or the great sagebush that smothers one wall. The trees of sweet bay were cut in the morning. The rosemary bushes had to be trimmed where their branches were lying on the ground. Someone has stepped on pieces in passing. All day long the heat strikes down on the parched, cracking earth, baking the stones, shriveling up any fern fonds that chance to catch its direct rays, drying up the little brook, and testing the powers of endurance of the scarlets and yellows, orange and reds, that are flaunting themselves in the face of the sun. To sit out of doors is only possible beneath the firs and larches, in the green shade by the wood house, where the sun never penetrates. And even here, it makes one warm to watch the glare beyond the thicket of trees, the hot air quivering, nothing but butterflies and dragonflies about, and not to break a breathless silence but the twitter of the tits, grub hunting in the larches, and the perpetual hum of uncountable insects who seem to find no heat too great. But presently the shadows of the pines begin to lengthen, and in the shade thrown by the larches along the meadow side, blackbirds are seen making short runs along the ground on foraging expeditions. Chaffinches, tits, linnets, and bullfinches come out from green hiding places and go down to the bird's bath to drink. Longer grow the shadows, the swallows rise and take high curving sweeps in the upper air, wonderful little aeronauts whom no man has trained. As the sun touches the top of the opposite hills, a breeze wakes up the birchwood, whispering that the sunset will soon be here, and the leaves start talking about the stifling heat that so exhausted them through the day. The sun drops lower behind the hill. Rabbits peep out from beneath the brambles, then make for the hummocky field that adjoins my cabbages, the field where the big oaks stretch wide arms over soft, green, luscious grass. Ofa's oaks, we have named these ancient giants, because they border Ofa's dyke, and they have so often described to the more youthful birch trees the time when they saw Ofa, king of Mercia, come marching past in 765 A.D., that at length they have actually come to believe they were alive and flourishing in his day. We humor their age by pretending that it was so. At last the sun disappears, flaming to the last in crimson and gold, orange and red. The breeze gets lustier after the sun has gone under, and a squirrel comes scampering head first down a tall fir tree in search of a delicious toadstool that he sometimes finds at its base. Pheasants strut up out of the coppice and roam about the pasture. Imperceptibly, you know not whence it comes, there steals over the earth the cool, refreshing scent of dew-drenched bracken, mingling with the sweet, wistful evening incense of some late honeysuckle. And, as you watch the fading afterglow of pink and saffron, sea-green and tawny rose, you sense that in some mysterious way the face of the garden has entirely changed. Gone is the fire of the scarlet geraniums. Lost is the vermilion of the nasturtiums. Even the sunflowers hang their heads, and the hollyhocks have turned off their lights. The marigolds have closed their eyes, and the eschultzias have folded up their brave flowers, the tired little heads bowing over, thankful for this respite. Then, 
as the Montbretias toll the angelus from crowds of golden-throated bells, the evening primroses, silently, gratefully, open a thousand blossoms and bathe the garden in a wondrous gleam. Such a clear, clean yellow it is, so quiet and yet so penetrating. It seems in some strange way to hold the radiance of heaven and focus it on the sleeping flower patch, subduing all that would strike a glaring note, hiding the ragged deficiencies of fading leaves and withering seed pods. By day, one scarcely notice the straggling plants at all, save perhaps to remark on their rather shabby appearance. But now they shine from terraces and wall tops, from crannies and the rough stone steps, they send up tall shafts, bearing aloft their evening lamps about the garden beds, among the currant bushes, at the edge of the gravel walk, between the stones in the paved path. Wherever they can find root room, they have taken hold. For they were ever wanderers, and given to exploring the farthermost corner of any garden, wherein they have made themselves at home. The last rose-pink flush has faded from the clouds. Not even a sleepy twitter is heard from bush or bough. The wind soughs softly in the pine trees, those harps of endless strings. From out of her hidden stores of abundance, nature has given moisture to the grass, refreshment to the fainting foxglove leaves, and damped the forest fern. Then, breathing quiet on a weary world, has bidden it take rest. Yet all are not asleep. Standing like sentinels through the darkest hour of night, the evening primroses, adding scent to scent, flood the garden from end to end with a veritable glory of swaying, gleaming moon gold. End of chapter 17 Moon Gold in the Garden Chapter 18 of Between the Larchwoods and the Weir This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nima. Between the Larch Woods and the Weir by Flora Clickman. Chapter 18 The Carillion of the Wilds. Of all the host of alluring things that make for themselves homes on our hillside, one of the most lovely is the foxglove. Yet there is no blatancy about its beauty, nor a great blaze of light as when the ox-eye daisies wave over the fields in June. There is something more subtle than even its coloring that attracts one to this flower, for there is mind rest, there is balm for anxious hearts, there is new hope and new courage with whispers of happiness in the depths of a foxglove bell. If you doubt this, go on a foxglove quest. Leave everything bearing the hallmark of advanced up to dateness far behind you. Though I have nothing to say against the train that takes you away from towns to the place where the foxgloves grow. Forget all the regulation ways of enjoying yourself and search out the haunts of the Carillion of the Wilds. You will find them on the shady sides of the hedges, their spikes of bells pushing up through hawthorn and slow through the tangle of bramble and byrony, cleavers and dog-rose that scramble over the pollarded nut-bushes, beeches, elm-stumps, and ash-bowls, amid all the dear delights that go to make that poem of loveliness an English hedgerow. You will also find them in little hollows and dells, in small ravines and in craggy places, in any spot where they can get a little moisture for the roots, and occasional sunshine for the flowers, with a certain amount of immunity from the devastating hand of the human marauder. 
give them but a ghost of a chance to seed themselves, though this is what the greedy flower-gatherer invariably denies them, and they will spread with great rapidity, and paint the face of nature with a rich glowing carmine that almost makes you hold your breath when first you see the broad sweeps of color on certain hillsides in mid-June. When you have found them in any of their haunts, lift one of the bells and look right into it, delighting in the splashes and markings, the fine filaments and the silken texture, the pink and purple and crimson, the dark brown and white, the poise of the stalk, the droop of the bells, the balance that the leaf arrangement gives to the whole plant, and the many other characteristics that go to make up one of the most exquisite of nature's products. The trouble is that in sparse soil, or in wind-swept places, the plant does not grow so tall as in a protected and secluded spot. Hence, when we meet it in the open, its bells hang downwards below the eye-line, and we do not often remember to stoop and lift one, to see what message the bee left for us. Perhaps that is one reason why it seems to me that, while sunflowers and hollyhocks spend their days in gazing after grown-ups, foxgloves are forever nodding smilingly and encouragingly to little children. To those who are accustomed to agricultural scenery, where the landscape shows far expanses of pasture land and cornfields, with wide spreading, low roofed farms clustered around with barns and ricks, our hills come at a surprise with their uneven surfaces and the scarcity of soil in comparison with the superabundance of rock. And even taking into consideration all the cleared spaces and small farms, the outstanding feature of the country, so far as the eye can see, is timber. This is a region of woods and coppices, with springs that bubble up at the roots of sturdy trees protected by their thick leafage from the onslaughts of the sun. This is a land of dim gray-green mystery, of silences that make one tread with reverent awe till one is brought back to earth by the ring of the woodman's axe, the leisurely song of his saw, and the crish crash of a tree as it falls. In the course of time, the woods have to be cut. Some are cut every fourteen years. Others are left much longer. It all depends on the kind of tree and the purpose for which it is being grown. But though the woods are cut periodically, it is not so devastating a process as one might imagine. For one thing, it is clean work. For another, it is surface work. And then, it is all done in the open air, with hand tools and no machinery. And it is carried out on nature's own lines. Hence, there is no underground disturbance that would prevent further growth, and no smoke of power-driven machinery pollutes the earth and air. Yet, there would be something very pathetic about the felling of the trees as you walk over ground that has been cut, were it not for the magical display of beauty nature puts forth in such circumstances. Multitudes of flowers springing into being that otherwise would not have come to birth. At first, you see but the prostrate trunks of the trees, with ivy still clinging to the bark. There they lie, with branches lopped, each surrounded by piles of small timber cut into regulation lengths for various commercial purposes, with cords of faggots for firing, and stacks of stuff for pea sticks and similar purposes. Yet you are not long wandering over the newly cleared slopes before you see things that were not evident before. In winter, you discover a red gold carpet, too golden to be brown, too brown to be red, where lie the leaves of the beeches that you never noticed when the trees were standing. Then, as spring breathes life into the sleeping earth, the dead leaves stir, silently 
mysteriously no human ear can detect the rustle no human eye can see the movement yet the leaves lift and move apart disclosing the yellow and green and silvery pink of the primrose buds still further the dead leaves lift and the violets look out and then run all over the place the wind flowers push up next and before you realize what has happened the place is literally dancing with them where did they all come from last spring you went through this very wood and saw only a few scattered about at wide distances where there is chance to be a filter of light through the dense branches overhead now the place is an open-air ballroom of curtsying sprites such are the wonderful ways of the woods in sheltered spots where the cold winds cannot reach cushions of wood sorrel unfurl their pale green leaves and then send up cautiously and shyly the fragile bells that lick as though a breath would blow them away the woodruff also sets to work for there must be beauty of odor as well as beauty of color and form and something will be needed to take the place of the violets when they go by this time the bluebells are ready to come out but there is no shyness about these sturdy in their growth no obstacle seems to hinder them up come the green spears making their own way through dead leaves and twigs and moss and acorn cup through thickets of low-lying bramble through carpets of close-growing ivy if a dead branch or a tree trunk lies in their way they peep out at one side is there a trifle of daylight here and up they come carpeting with blue the open spaces between the huge masses of rock that lie pell-mell about the surface while the humble little ground ivy lays cool green fingers and a little later its violet blue flowers over the cream and silver of the birches the soft gray of the beeches and the rough bark of the oaks where the felled trunks lie among the upspringing grass sensing for the last time the coming of spring and summer on the hillside then it is when the bluebells have turned to papery seed pods and the primroses have paled away into space that the foxgloves begin to shake out their flowers and the hillside glows and palpitates with color they flourish with a joyous abandon that is positively infectious and makes one feel there is still much left to live for the way they suddenly appear when the trees are down whole battalions of them where only a season before there were regiments of larches or thick woods of mixed timber is really marvellous undoubtedly the ground must be packed with seed more than this there must always be young seedlings coming up among the undergrowth or in sheltered crevices where the larch needles do not penetrate for no sooner are the trees cut then foxgloves start to spread their leaves to the light and by the following summer often before half the timber has been carried you find them by the thousand and that is a very low estimate dotted all over the rough land and with a host of ferns trying to cover up all that is maimed and bare and jagged to hide the scars where the mighty have fallen to give beauty for ashes in a very literal sense moreover there seems an almost uncanny intelligence in the way they adapt themselves to their environment you would think they knew that the winds from the far-off channel blow strong at times across these high open spaces for you find that they invariably place themselves in the shelter of a big boulder or settle down in a little hollow with a protecting flank of rockery evidently conscious that their tall stems would be lashed down flat if exposed to the full force of the wind or you find them growing it may be at the foot of a crumbling gatepost or against an ivy-covered rock or rows of them nestling close up to a lichen-covered stone wall and in this way 
their beauty is enhanced by the background and when they find themselves in an uncongenial setting springing up in the very centre of a woodland path perhaps or out in the open where the woodmen have been lopping the branches from a felled tree and there is much devastation to be covered over and atoned for there the foxglove lays its leaves as flat as possible against the earth so as to offer the least inducement to the passer-by to injure it and though it still sends up its flowers as bravely as it knows how they are only a foot high not the five and six feet of the foxglove in the shelter yet if it be possible in the least bit possible it leans against the pile of faggots or gently touches the desolate trunk of what was once a majestic old tree and who dare say that the silent companionship counts for nothing as i write this in a year of the awful war there are some who would tell me that foxgloves will not find the people in food while others see no value in the larches apart from their service as mine props yet while i would not underestimate the utilitarian worth of crops and timber the age-old truth is still insistent man cannot live by bread alone you may clear from the surface of the land every plant that is not edible you may fell every tree that does not serve for telegraph pole or pitwood you may tabulate the food productive qualities of the whole earth and serve it out in a blue book as literature for the people you may manufacture electricity till there is no longer any night and the mysteries of the twilight and the moonlight and the starlight are lost to us forever you may destroy the birds till there isn't one glad song left in the caterpillar riddled orchards and gardens you may harness the rivers and streams for mechanical purposes and drown the voices of the weir in the whir of wheels till there isn't an ounce of energy flowing to waste throughout the length and breadth of the country you may turn all nature into a huge commercial enterprise that is the last word in economics and efficient organization and what will be the result machines in place of souls germany strove to subserve everything to her own materialistic ends and the price of her hideous and colossal crime is a world's agony though this may seem but a parable to some the reading will be clear where there is no vision the people perish end of chapter eighteen the carillion of the wilds end of between the larchwoods and the weir by flora clickman